Today, we are joined by Jason E. Smith, union analyst, host of the Digital Young podcast, and author of Religious But Not Religious, Living a Symbolic Life. Um, our discussion today with Jason will be fought, uh, followed by an audience Q&A, but until then, we ask that you turn off your video for the discussion portion of the event, and then we'll bring your video back on later. So yeah, please turn off your video now. Great. And then we can have it focused on the speakers. So Jason, thanks for joining us today. How is it going? It's going very well. Thanks for the invitation. Glad to be here. Awesome. So just to kick off the conversation, uh, I feel like the most basic question is what is the symbolic? What are we talking about when we talk about symbols? Yeah, that's the most basic and probably the most complicated. So, uh, but essentially, you know, when we talk about sim symbols, when we talk about the symbolic, uh, a symbol is something that, uh, as Jung describes it, it's the best possible expression for something that can't be expressed in any way. And it, it's expressed in terms of an image. And what symbols point to are things that are outside of the range of our experience. They're beyond our everyday experience. They connect us to something uh, that is not yet known. And, and they do it through the means of an image from our experience. And so the symbol is a way of uh, our a point of meeting for us between our own experience and between that which is trying to find some uh, expression in our lives. So when we talk about the symbolic life, what are we referring to with that? And how is that related to religion? Well, the symbolic life, uh, simply put, is essentially a, a religious life. And, and by religion, uh, you know, we can open that up a little bit uh, in a moment. But really, the symbolic life is... Uh, it's an affirmation of the meaningfulness of life experience. It's the, the affirmation that there is something more than just our concrete biological existence, something deeper than that. And it's also a means through which we connect with that. So if, if someone has a, uh, a connection to a symbol that has some life to it, that has some uh, uh, aliveness and, and authenticity to it. You can't create a symbol. You can't uh, impose a symbol. It's really something that you encounter. So if someone has a relationship to that, um, they have a relationship to uh, a wider experience of life. And this gets into the question of uh, the connection with religion. And religion is very complicated, um, but in this sense, it, it's about uh, that connection to something transcendent, that connection to something uh, of depth and meaning that uh, infuses daily life with, with a more to it, with a meaningfulness to it. So we can think that this sort of development in the, in the initial concepts of religion was really maybe an attempt at us making sense of kind of running into these more symbolic transpersonal energies and 
mythology and ritual being built around it. And that sort of allowed people to uh, kind of rally around, you might say, a shared mythology. Um, but at its heart is really connecting us to that transpersonal center, to that symbolic aspect that kind of takes us out of the mundane and allows us to explore that, that other sense of, of the world and what it offers us. Right, right. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, there's a connection to the unknown. There's a connection to the ineffable, an experience of something that is beyond words, right? Comparable to uh, like the awe that you might experience looking out over like the ocean and, and the depth of the ocean and just the, the sublime sense of uh, that experience. And at the same time, we need means of communication. We need means of sharing that experience. And one of the things that Jung distinguishes is between uh, religion and the religious sensibility and what he calls a creed. And for Jung, the, the word creed, which is the belief system, uh, you know, it's, it's the institution. Uh, the, the word creed is what we usually think of as religion. And for Jung, the word religion is what we usually think of as spirituality, as that connection to the transcendent. Um, but he uses the word religion because it's got a certain uh, etymological uh, sensibility to it. But exactly right, there's an experience, there is uh, an encounter with the transpersonal in some way. And religions, the symbols, the stories, the images, the, the even the institutions and the rituals are, they're in a sense that they're like placeholders, right? They, they hold the place that their intention at its best is to help us get back to those original experiences, to reconnect. So they're like, almost like mnemonic devices. They hold the place because in our everyday life, we can't live in that space 100% of the time. We forget. It's so easy to forget and get bogged down in the concrete details of life. And we need a means through which we can remember and reconnect. That's one of the words, one of the meanings of the word religion, religio, is to reconnect. Uh, to that that depth and that um, that transcendent. Your work around these themes of you know that religious instinct to me speaks a lot of a continuation on uh, a lot of Jung's work, especially reading Memories, Dreams, Reflections, and understanding how he was raised in this very uh, religious tradition, but felt that a lot of that core and heart of of, of what religion really meant seemed to be uh, missing. And even though his father was a minister and he was raised in the church, uh, that quality of, of a true connection to that transpersonal center and then ritualizing it and, and embodying that symbolic life, you might say, seemed to be sorely missing. And it, it a lot of his life seems to be have been then the uh, the real journeying towards understanding that truth and that depth and, and trying to infuse our life back with that aspect of psyche that we might have lost connection with. Um, and I wonder if you felt inspired by his work in that way to continue to explore what that could really mean for us to, to, to return back to those spaces, but do so in a way that made sense for us in our modern time. I definitely felt inspired by him with that, without question. You know, one of the complications with religion is that many people who have grown up in a tradition have in some way or another been wounded by that tradition, right? And uh, that's very problematic. My own experience was that I, 
I didn't really grow up in a tradition. My connection, my family's connection with religion was, you know, it was there, but it was, you know, something tangential to everything else. Uh, and so when I found Jung, I found a means through which those experiences could be encountered in a way that made sense to my own kind of modern contemporary sensibility. Uh, one of the things I appreciate about Jung is both his respect for the actual living nature of religious experience, of the numinous, and his respect for the rational and the, the scientific. And, and his work is so much this uh, work of trying to convey uh, to a modern world those old truths. In fact, he talks about his work being kind of melting down the old forms and trying to recast them. And he talks about his psychology as being uh, just another metaphor, different metaphors for trying to connect to that same depth. And I, you know, finding that in Jung for myself was very life-giving and inspiring. And it allowed me to explore my own religious sensibility and uh, in a way that uh, made sense, in a way that um, uh, resonated with, uh, uh, with so many uh, dimensions and depths to it. So why do you think we've arrived at the current place that religion is now? There seems to be a lot of confusion about what religion is, what role it plays, even for people who I'd say consider themselves to be practitioners of religion. There's a lot of confusion about what religion is. And it, it, to me, it feels like it's often reduced down to a set of beliefs. And yes. why, what, where are the causes, do you think, of religion being where it's at now? What, what has brought us to this place? Well, you know, in some ways, the problem of religion and the problem of uh, kind of belief is, is age old. So we've had religious beliefs since there were human beings, right? Since uh, the... Uh, since Homo sapiens appeared, and maybe even before, right? There's evidence for religious activity forever. Um, and religion goes through these periods of development and upheaval, and symbols become dominant, and then symbols uh, fade out. So there's a, you know, there's probably a number of things. One is that as a symbol system begins to uh, decline in some way, you know, Christianity has been a dominant force in, in world history and in world religions for uh, 2000 years. And as that begins to decline with the, the rise of uh, uh, the scientific uh, worldview, uh, but also with uh, this expansion around the world. So now we are aware of all of these other traditions and all of these other truths. So one thing that happens, so the, the, the symbol system begins to decline and um, some people uh, start to get very rigid around it, defensive, and they want to hold on to it. They don't want to let that shift happen. So you start to kind of hold it and insist on a kind of concrete, literal truth. This is the one truth. But religion doesn't help itself either, because one of the things that 
religion tried to do as the scientific kind of mindset developed, religion decided that it was going to try to compete on that level and sort of prove itself scientifically. And it forgot that it, it's an entirely different mindset than the scientific mindset. Science does some things brilliantly. It's incredibly successful, but religion doesn't do those things. Religion talks in a different language. And I, in, in many ways, religion forgot that. It's trying to compete in a, in, in a domain where it, it, it actually doesn't really belong. You know, we shouldn't be using religion to prove certain facts about uh, the geological age of the earth, that you lose the mythology and you lose the meaning of it when you're trying to treat it as a proto-science. So there are a number of factors that fall into it. Uh, and I think our challenge today is that we live in a global uh, environment. We can't be provincial in our belief to, to, to say that this is the one true belief. If we don't have a sort of pluralistic sense that there are these other beliefs, we have to be exclusive. We have to say, okay, we're right, you're wrong. And that was easier to do when we didn't know all of the, the other traditions so well. But now, you know, you can go to a bookstore and you can pick up the scriptures of any tradition you want. Uh, in fact, you, you can just go online and they're all there. You can just start to, to read them right now. Um, and that really starts to interfere with the possibility of saying, only this is true. And so now we just don't know how to relate to these symbols, which still have life in them. Um, what is truth? How true are they? What's real about them? That gets very confusing. So I see this shift over time in human history where the kind of intellectualization of things the sort of turning the world into objects has this power of taking the world apart, turning it into a machine that you can tinker with. And that's been very powerful in our in technological development. But that same shift has been that the world goes from being symbolic into this matrix of meaning and kind of goes higher and higher into a place that's sort of mundane and lifeless. And do you see that being as sort of like the main loss is just like overly conscious, overly objectifying, overly materialistic. There's power there, obviously, but that there's just been kind of like an ascending out of the earth and into the void of space in some sense. Right, right. We get carried away with technology and we start to think about, um, traveling to Mars, uh, as opposed to tending Earth and, and having a sacred relationship with this Earth, right? We get carried away with our technological prowess. Um, I think your point is so important because what that ability shifts in our consciousness is it shifts our position in relationship to uh, ourselves and to the universe and to the world around us from a relationship of why, like why are we here and what's the meaning of life to how, how does it work? How can we make this work? How can we make this work better, right? And, and the machine is our favorite metaphor, right? Instead of talking about psychological development or spiritual development, we talk about life hacks, right? That's computer language. We, we can tweak the brain in some way and perform better. Everything gets described and understood in terms of productivity. 
How can we do it faster? How can we do it better? How can we do it more efficiently? But the question of why is left out. It's like, well, there is no why, we just do it. But that part leaves us as machine parts, right? There's a wonderful film, you know, there's the Charlie Chaplin film from like 1934, Modern Life, right? Where in that, at one point he's inside the machine, right? And it's the perfect metaphor. And Jung was uh, warning about the same thing at the same time that we were becoming uh, understood as machines. That's 1934. We're now 100 years almost later, and things have amplified since then. We treat ourselves as machines, right? We, we, we see ourselves in terms of uh, having to function better. And so if something is off, you know, if we have a bad day, we don't wonder so much about uh, what that might mean psychologically. We go, well, how can I get better? How can I get rid of this? And so we cut off our relationship with our deeper selves by doing that. We had Brett Alderman on the podcast last week. I don't know if you've connected with Brett. Um, but his book, which is Symptom, Symbol, and the Other of Language, is exploring this theme, that the, kind of this pro Promethean pattern of stealing the fire from the gods and kind of gaining consciousness and this way of objectifying the world and our bodies, turning our bodies from being this living magic thing into a corpse that can be dissected. Right. And he's... he's uh, talking about the way this is depicted in myth and has been depicted in myth for thousands of years and Adam and Eve even uh, gaining consciousness and being cast out of the garden, right? And this, this theme of losing touch with something. Right. And I wonder, do you see that thing that we're losing touch with as being the symbolic life? Adam and Eve being cast out as being cast out of the symbolic life, Prometheus being punished by Zeus in some senses, consciousness taking us away from the symbolic. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's an interesting kind of frame on it. Uh, and I think that there is, there is a lot of truth to that. You know, the phrase, the symbolic life comes from uh, a talk that Jung gave in 1939. And one of the things he says is, we have no symbolic life. We don't have it. We don't have that relationship to the cosmos in the same way. Um, and because we don't have it, our life is nothing but. It's just getting and spending and going through the day. Um, and so, I, you know, I do think that there is that element of uh, of cut, being cut off from something uh, primary. At the same time, you know, it does seem to me, and I think this is one of uh, the areas that Jung tries to work in, some of those early myths, like the Adam and Eve myth, do talk about what happens when we come to consciousness. And Jung's work is all about bringing the conscious and the unconscious back in relationship to each other. And he's very clear that consciousness and ego play a role, right? That if we don't have a connection to those, then um, the unconscious isn't as uh, constructive or creative in our life. It can in fact be destructive. Uh, and so we have to develop a relationship between the two. Um, but there is that, that sense of how do we do that? How do we reconnect? Um, how do we uh, live in relationship to something sacred uh, when, when we 
can see through a lot of our stories. We can see through a lot of our myths. It's a, it's a, real, uh, it's a real problem. It's a real dilemma. I think another way that I look at the devaluing of religion and the instincts that come with it is kind of on the opposing side of maybe moving more towards um, ego driven action or rationalization, but more of the devaluing of the ritual and the mythic aspect by aspects, you know, it depends of course on traditions, but in, in some of them we see that we no longer really cultivate the esoteric aspect of the, of the religion or the myth, or we don't um, sort of initiate ourselves more deeply into the, the deeper principle that is much more subtle in nature and rather are just sort of on a conveyor belt of, going to church every Sunday and listening to a sermon and you're praying, but you're not really doing much. It's like, we've, we've just hollowed out that rich symbolic mythical depth by not uh, valuing more of those esoteric principles that you might say. Mm -hmm. And I, and I know kind of coming from uh, a personal place that that was a bit of my experience growing up is that I felt sort of very ready to enter into um, my family's Catholic tradition. And upon going to my communion and, you know, they just sort of pushed every kid through, take your five Hail Marys, move on to the next one. I felt really cheated. I, to me, there was this sense of awe and potential that religion seemed to promise to me. And I think I got most of that more through uh, family members who had a deeper connection, who would sit and pray and taught me to do that. But the actual church itself seemed to just be on this track where that depth and that spirituality aspects seem to really be missing. And I think that makes people feel also sort of disenchanted with religion as well. And mm -hmm. I'm curious of what you feel, uh, one, if you think that's true, but also what can we do then in our everyday lives to cultivate that sense, sense of depth and um, to kind of bring that back into our lives if we've lost it through our religious traditions? Yeah, that is, a, a, again, it's another dilemma uh, and another uh, uh, real loss. Jung certainly felt that the religions, the creeds, had lost the capacity to mediate the numinous to its members, to be the means by which that original profound experience could be conveyed. In fact, he had an experience very much like yours, right? Like your experience with communion, he had, he had his own experience where he was studying with his father, I guess for his confirmation or his first communion or something like that um, in, a, you know, in the Protestant tradition. And he got really excited about the lesson that was coming up around the Trinity because that seemed very mysterious and offered this kind of esoteric sense, something meaningful was going to happen. And they got to the lesson and his father said, you know, we're just going to skip this because I don't really understand it myself. And his deflation and disappointment around that, uh, both on the level, the personal level with his father and on the, the, that more deep level, was part of what spurred him to, to start to wonder how can, what is the point of all this and how can we connect to these places of, uh, of spiritual depth? So it, it, it is a real loss. And um, one of the challenges with traditions and, and uh, institutions is that they often are centered around their own self-preservation. The danger with allowing too much of the spirit in is the spirit's creative and it starts to kind of shift things and change things. And, and that's very tricky if you're an institution that wants to kind of maintain itself. And there's a great theologian, um, Rabbi uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, and he talks about how um, 
people have generally made a, a god of the dogma and uh, they have more uh, belief in the dogma than they have belief in God because the dogma is sort of settled. The creed is settled and it doesn't uh, have that more unexpected uh, side of things. Getting in touch with it is, is challenging, right? That's part of Jung's work with uh, analysis. Um, it's hard to do it through, uh, um, through tradition sometimes. It's hard to do it without traditions. It's, it's a very tricky thing because one of the things that the traditions hold is this collective wisdom we don't live long enough in order to figure everything out. We just don't. There are, there's thousands and thousands of years of wisdom in all of these traditions and, and in all of these symbols, things that we could never create on our own. One of the things that Jung says, uh, or is reported to have said in one of the conversations that uh, uh, have been published is uh, he says, you know, I, I must know what the church says, and then I must find my own way. And so there's this sort of relationship between being in relationship to something collective, but also holding on to one's own individual discovery. I mean, I think the kinds of things like what you have set up where there's an opportunity for people to come together and collectively explore, this is what's needed because we're social beings, we're collective beings, we need to have conversations about these things, not just our own private study. You bring up this really great point that I, I think we have to walk between that tension of honoring and having one foot in the traditions and in the lineages, but still being open to finding our own path. Um, but it reminds me of some points you've made in your book about sort of self-selected spiritual beliefs that can really block us from those genuine experiences, or it can become much more shallow and it lacks then that aspect of growth and transformation. And I'd love for you to speak a little bit more on that, because I think especially in our current cultural moment, we're seeing a lot of individuals yearning for that connection to the numinous and finding something to replace it, whether that's some sort of sociocultural political movement to a DIY spirituality or kind of, you know, neo-religious um, practices that might not be contained in a tradition. So we're seeing a lot of scattered um, paths really forming for people. But it, in some ways, of course, not for everyone, there is that sense that it might lack that genuine depth. Right, right. That's a danger of a, a kind of do-it-yourself spirituality. Um, you know, it, it, it's easy to fall into a kind of temptation to just take the things that we like, that feel good, and have a spirituality that feels good. But feeling good, as important as that is, right? We need places of refuge, we need places of consolation. That's important, without question. But we need places of growth. We need places that will challenge us. So we need things that will rub against us, it, almost like sandpaper, right? Where it starts to like uh, be uncomfortable and, and, and challenge us in, our, in the places where we're too comfortable. Uh, and, and I think that that's what can get lost not necessarily always, uh, you know, there are certainly pe always people who uh, enter into whatever they do with a kind of depth and, uh, you know, a, a, a focus, a discipline. Um, and a spiritual life is a discipline, like uh, anything, learning an instrument is a discipline, or learning uh, 
to be a physicist is a discipline. You need uh, a lot of training and focus and, and, and intention. And spiritual life is the same way. And there are people who do that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we can do is we can use our spirituality as a kind of substitution. So instead of experiencing difficult things, we can kind of use the, the, the symbols in a way that protect us from experiencing things. And religion really, when it's approached in its proper sense, is supposed to make us experience life more deeply, all of life more deeply, all of the, the full range of experiences. It's supposed to uh, engage us more completely. Uh, so it's more of an exposure to the existential realities of life than it is a kind of nice and comfortable place to, uh, to get some relaxation. Something I feel like this touches upon is the ways in which religious practice or religious traditions can be sort of inconvenient for people. They're not the quickest route to the destination in some sense. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of the journey is being lost in favor of the destination. And um, I think this ties in with ritual, right? is that ritual is something that can, I feel like, be overlooked when we think of religion as being just beliefs. That there's right. actually sort of a, a, a way of life, there's a process, there's a participation in religion that is overlooked. And um, I feel like it's overlooked because sometimes it's inconvenient. Why yeah. do this ritual? Uh, why don't I just skip to the part where I you know, pray and then go home and watch football? Um, right. What is the ritual? What, what is happening with the ritual? How is it related to the symbolic? The ritual uh, is uh, um, the embodied symbolic, right? It, it's, it's an enactment, a, a performance within the the mythological structure, the symbolic structure of the story. It's a participation in the story. The interesting thing about rituals, of course, is that you don't just do a ritual once and then you've done it and it's over, right? We do, uh, you know, in, in the Christian tradition, they do Easter every year. They do Christmas every year. It's a repeat performance it's a reminder there's a cycle to it it ties us into the cycles of life and it ties us into the cycles of our own life it connects us with certain uh, experiences um, the communion ritual is done every week and and you know that's an interesting example right where you take the communion and you take it into your body. It's an, it's an enactment. So if it's done in the full spirit and presence and participation, you're taking something in. Very similar ritual in India where food is offered to the deity and the deity takes it and partakes of it. And then it comes back to the devotee who then takes it in. Right, And so it's a way in which uh, the goal is to feel your participation in your body, in the, uh, in the divine experience, in the transcendent experience. And that level of that idea of participation, I think, is really important because what the symbolic is not is an idea. It's not a concept, right? It's you can't just understand it and then like you say go watch football uh, it is inconvenient because it's an experience and it's a relationship 
a symbol is a function of relationship to something that transcends it. The ritual is that as well. It's a function of relationship. So it's like saying, I'm going to uh, just go quickly, kind of take care of my relationship with my partner for five minutes here. And, uh, you know, then I'm going to go watch football and everything's going to be fine. Well, if you're not really in relationship and you're just kind of uh, doing that sort of pro forma, uh, that's going to be felt. If you're not really in relationship to the other, uh, then it's just, um, it's a, a, a superficial act. And to me, this brings up um, a point that one of our audience members, Brian, brought up in, in the comments about uh, working at a Jewish temple and they sacrifice a piece of dough when making challah. And some of the uh, participants who don't feel as connected to the religion anymore don't like doing this ritual. And it kind of, to me, is almost like this chicken or the egg situation of like, what really comes first? Have we lost connection to the mythic? And so the ritual feels hollow and meaningless, or do we start devaluing the ritual, forgetting why it's connected to the grander narrative? And, you know, I think we can see that in, in probably all traditions in some form all across the world is that we forget really the reason why we're doing it. It's, it's lost its sense of meaning and things just continue to deteriorate so that, you know, Easter's just another day about eggs and bunnies instead of being about this re death and rebirth cycle and the beginning of spring. And we can even connect that to the Eleusinian mysteries and other traditions where it grounds you in this transpersonal mythology. It connects us to this archetypal flow through us. Um, and it brings up this question of how do we hold on to these rituals when we're losing sight of the myth as well? I think that's, that's you know, all of these are so important, the questions that you're bringing in. Uh, and we're talking about profound matters that are, are so hard to, uh, to really understand because part of the the experience that we've lost that facility with is not knowing not understanding to to be in the presence of mystery to let things uh speak to us on a a, a visceral level and not a cognitive and intellectual level and that experience of not knowing, the ritual does that. You enter in, you don't know what's happening necessarily. Something's happening, but if you can not try to figure it out and participate, it starts to speak to you in some way. And there's an alchemical idea that one book opens another. If you want to read one book, you have to read other books because they're going to give a perspective on this idea from over here. And you have to read from different angles in order to really understand. And this is one of the things Jung did with alchemy is uh, he took these concepts and he traced them in all the different ways they're used. The same is true in the religious sense. You can't understand the ritual if you're not engaged with the myth, the story, the scripture, and you can't understand the scripture if you're not engaged somehow with either the ritual or uh, some other kind of level of teaching or the community in some way. Uh, and so all of these things inform the, the, the experience of it, including the experience of our own lives, what happens to us is what we bring to those rituals. One last question I have before we move on to Q&A um, with the audience is, how important do you think it is for the symbolic life to be something that children have access to very early on? I think one of, something that's so difficult is that school is very devoid of the symbolic. And it seems very focused on sort of a more literal scientific concrete way of understanding the world. 
And by the time children grow up, they, a lot of them have no experience with the symbolic and they might arrive at it, you know, in their thirties, if they're lucky right. or not at all. And so I wonder how important is it for this to sort of be part of a child's life and part of their education? Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely crucial. I, I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, we know that children naturally have uh, a kind of uh, pre-disposition uh, um, to something called substance dualism. We come into the world with a sense of the soul. We just do. Uh, and one of the things that we've done by emphasizing STEM programs, science and technology programs, which are important, are crucial, we, we de-emphasize arts, story, imagination. And I think all of those are part of a, a developed symbolic life. So it's, it's absolutely crucial. James Hillman talks about stories, uh, the Jungian analyst, James Hillman, and he talks about, in his experience, people who grew up with story awareness, like they grew up reading fairy tales, they grew up uh, reading stories, and, and, and being told stories. Uh, they grow up with some kind of uh, uh, even religious story, depending on how that's uh, transmitted, right? But they grow up with stories. They have a much better outcome and a prognosis in terms of their psychological development because they've got an enhanced kind of metaphor awareness and the psyche operates so much in that kind of metaphorical domain. And so it, it's absolutely crucial. Anybody who has stories and, and, and all of that, even if they don't follow in the family tradition at some point when they need it, right? When life deals them some blow that they need, they have something to draw on that they can, they can build on. They've got some kind of story, some kind of image. We, if we don't have images, we just don't know how to process a lot of our experience. All right, we're going to move on to um, audience Q&A. Um, if you guys would like to turn your video back on, feel free to do so. And we'll kick things off with Henry, who had a question earlier. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Hey, yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to, I was just thinking whilst you were discussing symbols in the beginning and that they are obviously um, images, I was wondering why uh, symbols as creations of the psyche, why they primarily engage in the sense of sight rather than other senses, let's say smell, hearing, etc. Or look, why has the psyche or the collective unconscious, why is it prioritized images over other uh, senses, let's say, or over other means by which senses can engage in, in something? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question, Henry. Um, it's important to understand when Jung talks about image, that he's talking about more than just uh, a visual image, more than just a picture. Uh, there are certain types. He talks about visual types, and he talks about uh, verbal types. Uh, so people process information in different ways. One of the most uh, accessible images actually is rhythm and music. And, and those convey experiences uh, that 
maybe can't be conveyed by a visual image. So our, the understanding of image uh, from Jung's point of view is, is much broader. It, it includes visual images. It includes uh, uh, emotional experiences. It includes uh, sounds probably even includes smells. Uh, you know, we, we have this uh, amazing thing that happens where you, you, you catch the, the scent of something and it just connects you to some memory. Um, we get songs caught in our head, melodies and things like that. The way I understand image, frankly, is as an experience. The, the image speaks of an experience and uh, it conveys it in a number of ways. We're used to a lot of visual uh, imagery out of the religious traditions, but all religious traditions have songs, they have uh, rituals where there's a, a, a felt experience. So the the actual symbolic comes in, in many, many, many experiences. If you wake up one morning and you're in a mood and you don't know why, but it just won't leave you, that's a symbol. Don't necessarily know exactly what it is, but that's a symbolic experience. Something is kind of in some kind of relationship with you and it's a problem. And you're trying to understand what it is. So moods can be symbols. It's, it's a much broader range, I think, than that. Thanks. Thank you. How about Lori? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for this, it's absolutely great. Um, I, I guess my question is, a, a I don't know if it's a chicken and egg question, but, um, you know, do you think that it's religions that have kind of created symbol uh, in many of those symbols that we live with now? Is it that religions kind of created them? Or do you think that they tapped into existing symbols in order to establish themselves? You know, were they, were they kind of already there? Numinosity, was it already there? That kind of thing. And to what extent might that also apply to archetypes? So with, for example, the Jesus story, did that tap into existing archetypes or was it so kind of original that it was the genesis if you like of an archetype yeah that's a that's that is a good question um jung jung's belief is that it's impossible to create a symbol he says no one ever sat down with pen and paper and could come up with a symbol symbols are things that are encountered. And so from the Jungian point of view, the, the way that it sort of happens is there's an experience and it's deep and profound and it might be a dream image, it might be a vision, it might be uh, something that doesn't even register visually, something happens, a, a profound experience. And then comes this period of kind of wrestling with it and trying to describe in a sense what it is like, what is this like? And I think it's very much parallel to uh, the creative process. So when someone sits down, you hear writers talk about how the characters wrote themselves. What the writer is doing feels that the writer what they're doing is listening and and they're listening to something and they're experiencing it and they're writing it down emerson uh, ralph waldo emerson talks about how uh, all the poems have already been written they they're written somewhere and all the poets do is kind of transcribe them imperfectly the best they can that's his sense uh, my sense is that what happens is there's an original experience, someone tries to shape it, and then over time, the, the religiology 
the, the, the thought process, the theology, the thinking and the rational starts to shape that and starts to say, well, what does that mean? And so a lot of those symbols are honed over time and, and they've been shaped and, and uh, uh, kind of subjected to a process of uh, collective shaping. As far as the archetypes like the Jesus archetype, uh, you know, there are countless experiences and images of the dying and resurrected God. Um, and that Jesus, the figure of Jesus, kind of gets adapted to that archetype, uh, which preceded him. Uh, suggests that, you know, someone, there is a sense that, okay, this is something similar to that. And it, and it gets uh, um, kind of infused with that old archetype. And for Jung, if something like that story, the Jesus story is infused with an archetype, for him that says, that makes it more reliable than if it were just sort of created out of whole cloth because it's rooted in something that is deep and lasting and true for human beings in general. All right, we're about at the top of the hour. Um, Jason, where can people find your work? Do you have any projects coming up that you'd like to advertise, anything like that? Yeah, well, thanks for, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I just finished up, I have been doing a, a podcast, Digital Jung, for the last 10 months or so as a companion to the book. Um, I'm taking a summer break from that, and I'll come back uh, in the fall with uh, some more podcast episodes. Um, and I'm going to take the summer to kind of figure out what those next projects are. I've got a couple of uh, ideas for things that I I want to to write, but I want to let them kind of uh, point me in the right direction rather than kind of force something. So we'll see what comes up out of this kind of summer hiatus. Thank you so much, Jason. Everyone, let's go ahead and give him a muted round of applause. It's <laughs> wonderful to have you today. Uh, we do have some upcoming events at the Golden Shadow on July 10th. Murray Stein will be joining us to speak about the Jungian revolution, what's going on in the modern day with Jung becoming so popular. And we also have a, a workshop coming up on alchemy and the four operations that relate to the elements, fire, earth, air, and water. That's Saturday, July 24th at 12 p.m. Um, more events will come up. So head over to goldenshadow.org for more info. And we hope to see you all next time. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, all. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash goldenshadow.org. If you'd like to keep up to date with our projects, attend one of our live events, or work one-on-one -on -one with myself or Aaron, head to www.goldenshadow.org. Thanks for listening. See you later.